Good evening, everyone. How are you today? Good, good, good. Uh, this is the December 12th meeting of the Evanston Plan Commission. Uh, the first order on the agenda is uh, declaration of a quorum. Okay. Commissioner Draper? Aye. Commissioner Dubin? Here. Commissioner Goddard? Here. Commissioner Halleck? Here. Commissioner Isaac? Here. Commissioner Pagotzi? Here. And Chair Ford, uh, Chair Lewis? <laughs> Here. <laughs> Okay, tough, we do have a tough. quorum. We've got everyone. Great, we've got a quorum. All right, the uh, first order of business is a plan development at 1714 through 1720 Chicago Avenue, 18 PLND 0053. Uh, oh. Approval of minutes. I'm sorry, I've uh, I've I've misstepped. All right. Uh, the second order is approval of the minutes of the uh, meeting of November 14th. Is, does anyone have any comments, questions, corrections, alterations? Do I have a motion for approval? Second. Okay. Commissioner Isaac, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? All right, now backing up, uh, uh, we have uh, the plan development at 1714 through 1720 Chicago Avenue. Uh, Mr. Mangum, I, I believe you're going to uh, present the petition. Yes. Oh, it's been a while, huh? Uh, so uh, tonight uh, we're going to uh, Going to uh, the the process will be we'll have an introduction by by staff, then there'll be a chance for the petitioner to present their case. At that time, uh, uh, the uh, the commissioners can ask questions of the petitioner. Then we would open up the floor to questions from the public. Uh, people who are speaking from the public uh, are limited to two minutes, and and the first portion will be questions of the of the petitioner. So uh, there'll be time later on for statements if you wish to give, give statements. Uh, and uh, after uh, after the. Uh, uh, questions will will close the close the hearing and uh, go into deliberations. Uh, so, so uh, with that, would you like to swear? swear them in now? Okay. All right, everyone. If you're if you are going to speak, I would like you to raise your right hand and swear that you are going to tell the truth. All right. Do you swear to tell the truth? Very good. Thank you. All right. And then when you come to the podium to, testi to testify or make ask questions, come uh, state your name and address for the record, and then speak in speak only at the podium into the mic so we have a permanent record. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now let's do it. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Lewis, members of the Planning Commission, members of the public. I'm Scott Mangum, Planning and Zoning Administrator. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of the uh, request um, and the, the items and relief sought by the applicant, uh, and then go over the, the staff recommendation and the standards. Uh, and then the applicant will have a presentation with, with more details about the project design. So 1714 to 1720 Chicago Avenue, the applicant is requesting uh, both a map amendment from the current zoning district, which is R6, general residential, to the D3 Downtown Core Development District and also a planned development. Um, this planned development includes seven site development allowances which are requested for additional floor area ratio, building height, front yard setback, both side yard setbacks, number of parking spaces, and the front setback of the uh, canopy projection. Property is currently about 26,750 square feet, about six tenths of an acre. The applicant is also proposing to vacate a portion of the, the city alley. So with that vacation, it would increase the size of the property to just over 27,000 square feet. 
What's proposed is a 13-story building with a four-story uh, base of parking and nine stories of office above. The office is approximately 136,000 gross square feet. As part of the proposal, uh, 112 parking spaces are proposed. 22 of those are compact or spaces that do not otherwise meet the eight and a half by 18 foot uh, standard size stall um, by city code requirements. 213 spaces would be required for the, the office portion of the building. Additionally, the, the parcel is currently used for a library parking lot and part of the purchase sale agreement was to replace the parking spaces on that lot, which would be an additional 74 spaces uh, required for that replacement. Building height is 167 feet to the roof. Uh, the zoning ordinance allows for the exclusion of uh, up to four levels of parking up to 40 feet. So that, that brings it to 127 feet for the zoning height of the building. On the screen is a, a layout of the first floor. So to the right of the screen, uh, the lobby is um, Chicago Avenue. So the front of the building has a lobby uh, in the middle, a uh, bike room um, on the, the lower portion or um, southern portion of the front facade, and parking areas on the front portion on the, the northern end of the facade. The developers proposing to have these parking spaces on the first level be open to the public at all times. And additionally, the loading area is shown on the um, western portion of the site. That um, diagonal line there is the current property line, so that is where the applicant is proposing to vacate a portion of the city alley to extend the building uh, over that right-of-way, and that's where the loading would occur with um, uh, trucks and, and vehicles, loading vehicles entering from the south into that loading bay that's oriented uh, in the north-south direction whereas um, vehicles for the parking would enter facing east uh, from the alley, the existing north-south alley that uh, runs through the block from Church to Clark. On the screen are the de development allowances that are being sought. Um, so this table shows you what the base zoning allows if it were to be rezoned to the D3 district. So building height 85 feet would be allowed, a uh, site development allowance of up to another 85 feet can be requested. So the proposed zoning falls within that site development allowance that's being sought, um, as well as the FAR 4.5 is allowed with the base zoning, site development allowance of um, up to an additional 3.5 FAR, so a total of eight could be requested. 5.0 is proposed, so that's also within the site development allowance that may be requested. So with that, there's no super majority vote that would be required at city council because they're not proposing to exceed the maximum site development allowances there. Additionally, you'll see the, the number of parking spaces required as mentioned, 213. Uh, the front property line setback, which is the block average of 31.4 feet, which would be required, where 25 feet is proposed. Side setbacks, 15 feet are required on both the north and south property lines. Uh, five feet are proposed to both of those. And a canopy yard obstruction, 3.1 feet is allowed, uh, which would be 10 10% of the, the allowed uh, front yard setback, uh, and 9.7 feet is, is proposed for that front yard um, canopy obstruction. The developer has submitted a list of public benefits. Um, as, as they see being public benefits, won't go through them all in detail. They're included in the staff report, but they include um, a partnership with uh, ETHS uh, for students, um, including a bike room in the building that would be available to the, the neighboring um, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, having conduit run for potential future electric vehicle parking, uh, including the parking spaces, replacing some of the parking spaces that are there with covered parking spaces as opposed to the, the current open parking spaces, allowing public access for uh, additional parking, the, the full amount of parking spaces after 5 p.m. on weekdays and, and all hours on weekends. Um, some additional uh, attempts to address concerns um, regarding bird-friendly measures and to hire an arborist to evaluate existing trees and the purchase price of the land that the developer is proposing to purchase from the city and currently has a sales contract for the city for $4 million. This project has been reviewed by the Design and Project Review Committee. It's a staff committee. Um, staff reviewed this uh, project and is recommending denial. 
Should the plan, plan commission vote to recommend approval, we've included a number of suggested conditions of approval that would be included in an ordinance that would go forward to city council if the city council did approve it. So those are shown here and again in, in the packet in detail, but it'd be including uh, requiring that plat of vacation for vac vacating a portion of the city owned alley. Um, analyzing traffic in the future because there were our concerns um, with the traffic operating in that alley and that kind of con constrained space and uh, allowing for additional study of that in the future and additional operational restrictions, uh, limiting delivery hours, and then suggesting public benefits to city's public art fund, um, including electric vehicle charging stations within the development currently, um, bird friendly measures, and some of those are detailed, installation of a parking signage and detection system for off-site parking within the city's Church Street Library parking garages that would show what the, the real-time availability is for those. Uh, replacement uh, and, and uh, paying for pay stations for parking on Chicago Avenue, um, and entering lease agreement for parking spaces that would make up the deficiency in code requirements within city parking garages. That would be 100, 122 spaces that are not being prepared or proposed as part of the development. Um, additionally, uh, the construction management plan um, and other standard conditions uh, that are included in plan developments. This uh, development was seeking both a plan development and um, a map amendment is subject to standards and several sections of the city zoning ordinance. Those are shown on the screen here. Um, standards for amendments, for special uses, for plan developments, and then standards and guidelines for plan developments within the D3 district if the a property were to be rezoned to the D3 district. We also have those um, standards in, in detail as, as the commission um, gets to deliberations. We could go into those in, in further detail. That concludes the summary of the staff presentation, and we are available for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll let the petitioner uh, uh, present their case. If you can state your name for Sure. <clears throat> Is this the uh, remote for the my um it will pull up his uh oh great thank you scott and so I could just scroll with the right button? It should. Give it a try. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul Janicki with Paul Janicki Architects in Evanston. Um, our team here tonight is Greg Steik with um, Chicago Avenue Partners, our developer, and Dennis Vovos with Halbert and Root, um, Kevin Boyer with Halbert and Root, and Steve Corcoran, who's our uh, traffic engineer. Um, so just um, like to start out, and I'll try to keep this as short as possible. Um, we're responding to an RFP by the city of Evanston to sell their property uh, at the library parking lot for redevelopment. Um, their own uh, RFP says the zoning change um, will be necessary, that the uh, requirements for this um, uh, uh, site should be a, a for-profit office building, which we are doing. Um, a contextual development, which we hope we're doing, and a high quality design, which we'll leave that to you. Um, several developers submitted proposals, and this is sort of why the gestation this period of this uh, project has gone on further. Um, other uh, proposals were made and rejected by the community at uh, ward meetings. Um, we were then uh, contacted and then we um, uh, teamed up with Halbert and Root to uh, come up with this design. Um, we also reached out to uh, numerous discussions with Francis Willard Organization, the Women's Club of Evanston, um, and um, last year the Women's Club of Evanston actually um, came here to support us. Um, I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, the site consists of um, two lots, as you know. It's, um, let me see if I can get to uh, these slides. I'll try to get to them faster. You know the context. Oh, did you want to see some of these? 
Um, some of the buildings we looked at, you know, downtown that we really <clears throat> admire and think of a high quality architecture, the Marshall Field Building, um, the Carlson Building, um, Orrington, the Library Plaza Building. Um, here's our site on Chicago Avenue. Um, and here is uh, the zoning map, as you see, that our site is now in R6, but we're petitioning to be in D3. Um, this is a, a, an aerial drawing showing um, buildings that are over nine stories uh, in the general vicinity, and, and our site is the highlighted blue portion in the middle of the, all that. Um, this is an aerial, again, of downtown without our building in the parking lot uh, without development, and this is um, a rendering with that building placed there. Again, this is a different view taken from the southwest uh, without our building and then this with uh, the building um, installed. Um, let me get to this site. Um, this, um, this vacation in the alley, uh, I'd like to explain a little bit if I could. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we want to do this. Um, actually, a few reasons. One is to get a loading dock that works um, more efficiently in the alley. Um, that can be loaded more easily. And also, uh, if we didn't do this, we're gonna start to lose um, our parking plan and our parking numbers, which are already very tight and lower than we'd like. And, um, and, and th that's why we're asking for this vacation of the alley and also the curb cut across the alley. Um, we had the, you know, everyone's, a lot of people are concerned about how the alley functions and safety of the alley. So uh, one of the major components we had is the fire department um, came out to um, actually drive a truck through the alley uh, to see how it would operate in the alley with the, uh, the footprint of the building um, that was actually at that time all the way out to the far lot line to the west with no setback um, and with the curb cut. Um, they said that was fine, that worked for them. But in the meantime, we had more discussions with them and we decided to pull the building back a little more to the east, another five feet to make that uh, whole intersection just a, a little safer. But we have um, approval and a letter from uh, the fire department, which we have in this new package. Um, so let me get down to our deck. We, you know, we, we also determined um, to get a fishing lowering dock and, um, and the aesthetics of the building not being a triangular end. Uh, we really wanted to rectangularize the back of the building just so it would still be a handsome you know, edifice on the alley. We thought that was just as important as being handsome on the front end. Um, so we are asking for a 321 square foot vacation of the alley. Um, Sorry. Uh, there are also um, truck diagrams that we had our engineers do uh, showing semi-trailers coming in and out, and um, those all look like they work, but those are also available in this packet if you want to review those. Um, so as you see in the studies of the parking, it was determined that there was a minimal parking load experience during the daytime hours. This is about the, the surface parking lot um, for the library. Um, we did studies for a number of cars on three different days, um, and we found out there was um, you know, a lot of empty spaces in the surface lot and an additional empty spaces in the, um, the basement uh, parking lot of the library. Um, so our feeling about the parking is that if we took all the cars that were on the surface lot during the daytime hours and put them in the basement um, of the library, it would accommodate all the cars during the day. And on top of that, we were going to put 21 additional cars on the ground floor of our, of our structure. I, one of the things we talked about um, as far as this development was, was replacing the 74 spaces. And now that we have 112, the, the 74 spaces there need to be used for the library are in the evenings and on weekends. That is when we, we find out that's when the load is for that lot. And now there will be 112 spaces that will be devoted entirely to the public and for library users uh, after hours and on weekends. So we've kind of felt like that was a symbiotic relationship that yes, we're gonna be using a lot of those spaces except for the ground floor during the day for office workers, but at five o'clock they leave and the, all those open up and are used by the citizens. Um, we also, you know, we looked at very hard at, at how to how to park, and, and it's a really difficult site. And and in order to get a, a building core, an elevator core, 
and a double loaded um, a parking structure. Um, it, the building came to almost exactly to the point where we would have five foot setbacks on either side. And that's what really drove the, the, the width of the building. Um, just if you're wondering why we got to that point. Um, the first floor, as we mentioned, has mechanical and utility equipment. Um, and we have the bike room, of course, which holds 50 bikes. Um, we go to a typical floor plan. Um, as you can see here, there are terraces, landscape terraces on the north and south at the first office level, and those are available to um, everybody um, in the bill. Um, let's get past these. From, you know, from the beginning, um, our goal was to build a, a base that would be um, that would incorporate our car parking garage, of course, but relate to the, the scale and the fenestration and the materials of our neighbors. Um, we're matching the brick and stone of the Mayo Design Women's Club. We also want to create a contemporary version of the front porch to have a conversation with the, um, the other porches on the houses directly north. Um, this is a view looking north, looking south along Chicago Avenue. And these are the elevations, which I'm sure you've probably already seen. But tell me to slow down if you want me to. Um, this is um, a rendering that we provide to explain, better explain, how the alley works. Um, there's a new crosswalk. There's no crosswalk now. We created a crosswalk with signage. Um, you, you exit the garage here where you see the people with the stroller, and, and now you have a, a place to go across. Um, there's a new stop sign that we're proposing um, at the uh, north end here um, so that you have a, kind of a place for people to stop and pause so that the, there's a safety factor there as well, we feel. Um, this is, again, another character drawing of some of the materials this is an all steel sort of a cage you know entryway with canopy uh it's it's a cast stone on the bottom a combination of cast stone and precast uh the brick is normal brick size not jumbo brick it's to match the women's club brick the spandrels are sort of a powder coated um called a crenellate or herringbone um you know <clears throat> striate herringbone <laughs> but the best way to describe it I mean, you see more of the materials. This is the sidewalk that links Chicago Avenue through our property all the way to the alley. And then this is one of the terraces uh, facing south that's on the first level of office space. And here's sort of a close-up of how some of these mulls, these large mulls, kind of get attached to the building and how the spandrels work. And, and we want to use um, a lot of uh, mullions to break down the scale of these windows and not just have big glass openings. And that's pretty much what I had to say. Did you want to add anything? Okay. Okay. I guess that's it. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Oh. Um, we have a new list of public benefits that's in this package. Do you want me to scroll to that? And uh, if I own you, um, let's see what page that's on. Excuse me, I'm sorry, folks. Yeah, page 71, wherever that might be. Whoop, I think I passed it. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, would you? If you can read that. I can't. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so when we went through DAPR, uh, two of the big reasons they said they didn't to give us a positive recommendation to plan commission were public benefits and, and, um, and the alley. And um, I think, Paul, you guys could see the packet. I, I, I'm not, the, I'm, I wasn't sure why the fire department chief wasn't at DAPR, but we have his letter. We, we spent three months figuring out the alley. But with public benefits, um, we were told by staff to reach out to the, the, the council to see what, what public benefits can go to each ward. And, and remind, I have to remind you, this, this project's been going for about two and a half years. So interest rates are up about 200 basis points. So this project is, we're, we're trying to keep it all together financially. So number one, the first bullet point we, that we left out of the dapper uh, presentation, we're going to uh, install landscaping treatment along the 
west side of Chicago Avenue to make a seamless transition with other landscaping in the immediate area. That's a new one. Installation of street trees in the parkway along Chicago Avenue, as well as mature trees on the terraces on the north, east, and south sides of the building. Replacement of and or upgrading of the pavement of the entire alley in the back of our site. Um, that's a big one. That's um, We did not put that in dapper. Installation of new sidewalks from north lot line to south lot line. Installation of signage, a newly constructed crosswalk in the alley directly in back of the subject lot. Replacement and coordination of public and private signage, landscaping, and hardscapes to complement downtown environment. Exceed the minimum of City of Evanston set asides for local labor, particular local MBE, WBE participation. Developer will coordinate GC to outreach into local city labor. Developer will outreach to local grammar schools for field trips, visits when completed. That was um, an interesting one. Um, and then everything else is, Paul, everything else is, is in the um, original list of public benefits. So I wanted to make sure that you guys got that. Well, the, the, last, the last element, why the signage, um, so that we can Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was left out. The, the, the last bullet, but provide signage to guide vehicles to available parking spots at library, basement, parking garage. All, all three garages. All three garages. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I, I think I'm going to open it up for questions from the commissioners for the petitioners. Are there any questions? Commissioner Dubin, that's fine. Um, when the traffic studies were done, did you take into account the fact that a lot of people using that library lot are only there for a limited amount of time, an hour to two, and what that might do to traffic in and out of the alley? Uh, my other question is when you assessed how much money would come to the city through a building, the housing office workers, that's based on the best of all possible worlds, isn't it? And is there, is there the demand for office space here that might fill the building? I'm going to let you traffic. end traffic, if that's okay, and defer. <laughs> But good evening. My name is Steve Corcoran with Erickson Engineering Associates. And uh, yes, we did take into account the ins and outs. I mean, we did traffic counts uh, in the surrounding area of our study area, as well as at that intersection where the library garage exits, where the two lots exited. Um, and, you know, that includes a combination of employees plus library patrons. So those were, we did incorporate the ins and the outs for library patrons. Thank you. Yeah. Class A office space in the city of Evanston is in high demand. That's why um, I think the staff issued an RFP. Um, um, there are many Fortune 100 firms looking to relocate um, to Evanston. A lot of the CEOs live in Winnetka. And, North Shore area, and they would rather not drive to downtown, and they would rather drive to Evanston. Um, we, we're, we're, when we looked at the building, we'll probably have north of 500 employees every day. Um, now, the industry standard for spend, uh, what what will office um, workers spend per week in the downtown Evanston area? Well. Um, what what I'm seeing is they they'll spend anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of their salary just eating out every day. Um, what does that mean for the city of Evanston? Probably anywhere from two to three million dollars of money spent in the downtown area. Commissioner Halleck, please. Yeah, I've got a sort of excuse me for my voice. I I can't talk tonight, but I'll uh, force it out. 
a couple of, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, when you say there's a demand, but the, I think the question here is the, the amount of square feet that you're that you're proposing to build, and what what two-part question? What is your planned absorption rate? In other words, do you think it'll be two years, ten years before the building is fully occupied? Uh, because that gets to the to the volume, to the amount of, of space and the amount of floors and all the other issues. Second related issue is what you, you have a very minimal amount of parking for the office space, I think. And what is the typical ratio of square office square feet to uh, to parking? <clears throat> the typical is roughly a thousand square feet of rentable to per employ or per parking spot. So um, we felt, and Paul, we could talk about this with the the TOD development. We're we're a block away from the Purple Line, and we're block maybe two blocks away from the Metro. So that we consider this a TOD development, transit-oriented development. Um, what we're hearing is that having roughly 112 spots for 130,000 square feet of rentable space is right around industry a thousand square feet per parking spot. Uh, what was your second question, or what was your first question? Uh, uh, the first question was parking, but uh, the absorption. Oh, well, we feel that there'll be roughly a 18-month construction schedule. Um, we will, we should have 50% of the building leased before we start, we break ground. And by the time that the building is um, where I get a certificate of occupancy, we should be at 75 to 80 percent filled. And that's based on a, a study of some sort of a market study. And could you share that market study with us? Sure. We got that from a number of brokers. So, yes. Any other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Goddard. Um, I just have a small question of the 74 spaces that are on the library lot now that you're supposed to replace. How many of those will be available for residents to park? All 112. All 112 during the day? Between, yeah, between after hours, after 5, and then uh, full on. Okay, but if I'm going to the library, I'm not going to be able to use those spots. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You mean like during, during I'm sorry, I mean during a weekday, yes. like afternoon. Um, our traffic study and on three different days shows that that lot has approximately 21 spaces filled. Um, and then there are about 23 empty spaces in the garage underneath uh, the library, which is a really nice garage. I don't yes, know why more people don't use it. I use it when I'm, my kids are growing up. Um, so our thought is all those cars during a normal typical day can be accommodated underneath, which we would hope that would happen. And then our garage is sort of overflow. So all those 21 surface spaces in our garage then are for an overflow for an odd day when there might be, you know, 21 additional cars. And then on the week, once five o'clock hits, yeah, that's a whole all the car, yeah, all the car, yeah. Yeah, all 120 spaces. So, so, I'm sorry, did I answer? So, so just to clarify, just to clarify, there are 21 spaces that are available, three, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days that's a correct. year, all that's, the time. And that's the correct. remainder are only usable after five and on weekends. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. I have another question. What is how is the setback for your building compared to the other buildings along that street? Front, well, if you're talking front setback, front. Well, setback. if you're talking about the Whole Foods, for instance, that's a zero yard setback. The Carlson Building is a zero yard setback. The I'm library. talking about yeah. the Women's Club and the historical buildings. They're about thir I think in average they say of 34 feet your front yard setback, and ours is 25. Okay. So we are out there, you know, obviously a little more. Yeah, we have a drawing that shows that, and 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 I believe that it's it's our kind of the our kind of piece of the lobby that sticks out that gives us that dimension. So I mean, we could take that away. We don't. We rather not because we think it's a beautiful thing to do for the street. But you know, yeah, it's 
malleable. You do stick out. You do stick out a little further. Yes, we do. You break yeah. up then. B basically, we do stick out a little bit further. That's true, yes, as it's drawn now. Okay, Commissioner Pagosi. Could you explain maybe uh, where the idea, uh, what's the idea about the form of the building? I mean, I get, you know, you've picked up some elements from the Carlson building and, and um, Marshall Field and some of the other ones you pointed out to, but the, the actual form of the building with the towers and the infill of curtain wall? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, when we, first, when we first looked at the building as sort of a, as a massing study, it, it's a cube. <laughs> it's a really inelegant plop. In fact, <clears throat> the other RFP, the other people that responded to the RFP, the other developers all came in with things that were just like just a block. And it was really inarticulate. And we felt that the only way to get an elegant sort of thing that matches some of the the aesthetics of um, what happened earlier in downtown Emerson with those really lovely buildings was um, was a, a, was a, sort of a, a technique like that to help break up the facades into like four corners and so that you basically sort of slenderize the elevation. That's, you know, for lack of more articulate way of putting it, that was the idea. Okay. Thanks. Okay, sure. Another question. Couple questions. Um, do you know the height? How how your building compares in feet to the Whole Foods Tower? I forget the name of it. Um, I don't know the exact feet, but it's thirteen stories versus. But they're shorter 25. stories. They're, they're shorter stories. So I, I just wondered in feet. Oh, oh, I see. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. It's something I could definitely get for you, though. Yeah. Second question. Um, when you showed the rendering of the base, sorry for my voice, the, the base of the building, um, you showed windows in the parking, on the parking floors. Mm, right. So what exactly are those? That's uh, like a, <clears throat> a Benheim uh, etch class, which is sort of, it lets light permeate and uh, motion, but it, uh, you won't actually see automobiles, and that was the idea, is to, is to get a fenestration, you know, get a punched opening to match, um, get closer match the other, like the punched openings of the women's club, for instance. But obviously, we don't want to necessarily see cars and bumpers and taillights, so the idea is, is sort of obscured. Okay, this is the, uh, the sample of that oh, thanks. I see. I see. Thank you. I see lots of lights on. Has anyone actually going to, uh, Commissioner Draper, thank you. Um, you've spoke about the boundary to Chicago. You're proposing only being five feet set back from the side boundaries. So what is the condition on both of those with the adjacent properties? How far back are they to that boundary? And is there a bit of a, a space? What's the setback from those? Uh, I think the house just to the north of us, and you know what, we just probably find it. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a little site plan that shows, uh, there it is. Um, it's, I don't have the dimension there, but um, I would, I hate. I don't want to say guess, but I would think it's probably around 20 feet from the face of that building to our property line. So 25 feet to between buildings. Let's call it. Okay. And don't but hold. Don't hold me to it. And there's no fences separating those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And along Chicago Avenue, do you anticipate that you'll be able to keep the existing trees? On Chicago Avenue? Yes. Oh, uh, along Chicago? Absolutely. In fact, I think we're, we're actually proposing planting more trees in the parkway. Okay. Commissioner Goddard, one more, one more time or just uh, errant light? Okay. Commissioner Isaac? Yeah. Can you explain to me the, uh, uh, the changes to the project since... Um, the city council uh, approved the um, approved the sale of the property to you. I believe it's supposed to be an eleven story building with uh, one hundred and thirty six thousand square feet 
and now it's a I think eight stories of eight stories of uh, um, sorry office space. Now it's thirteen no. with nine stories of office space, but still one hundred and thirty six thousand square feet. Can you explain like uh, what am I what am I missing there? I'm not sure of those. I'm, do we know those numbers? Uh, doesn't sound right though. It, it doesn't. Yeah. No. I mean, what happened is <clears throat> when we had all these meetings with staff and with um, Alderman Fisk, um, there was um, a lot of input about parking. And, and they didn't think we had enough parking. Mm -hmm. And parking was a really big thing. And we're trying to keep this base, you know, to the scale of like the women's club to try to make it feel like it's organically part of this block. And if we were to provide all the parking that Zoni asked for, we computed it, it's a nine story parking base. So we did add one extra level of parking because we felt we could probably we squeezed some things a little bit, tried to um, truncate some of the floor to floors and made the slabs and structure. We tried to play games there to try to get that base being four levels, but still being you know not a full blown one more level in real height. Mm -hmm. uh, so we chopped a little bit off, not much, a little bit uh, to the point where I felt it still sort of does the job of being you know commensurate with these other lower buildings. But then because the developer felt because now we're adding another level of parking, which of course costs money to build, um, that we need more revenue. Therefore, another leasable floor. That's that was the logic. So, but it's so now it's nine floors. So now it's nine instead of eight. Okay. It's four decks instead of three. All right. Yeah. And um, are you proposing to increase the purchase price for that additional? Uh, for that additional floor, I, I can't answer that. But um, I, I'm just yeah. Because I, I know I know there was a, a negotiation where the price went down. Right. Um, but if you're adding another floor, is the price going to go back up? I th I don't know. Ask this man in the suit here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if two years ago we got this approved, but now since construction has gone up and interest rates have gone up, this project is is. We wouldn't have made it without another floor. And and remember, Paul, we, we squeezed the floors down to try to create the base. It went up 21.4 feet. So it, we're right between a story and a half. And so we, we had to increase parking. We tried to keep the architect under so we could squeeze the floor to height ceiling. So we kept the same front elevation where we weren't, there wasn't a big parking deck for next to two buildings and we tried to we tried to keep the we went up a, not we went up another story in parking but we tried to keep we squeeze the the building down so we can go up maybe a story and a half um, so yes I would have paid more two and a half years ago but right now the way interest rates are going and the way the construction prices it's it's thin right now to make it a few more questions. Um, with respect to uh, parking, um, I understand that you're you're saying that after five o'clock, all the spaces will be available yes. uh, for public use. Right. Um, I I currently park downtown, uh -huh. and um, you know I work in an office of maybe like thirty five people. Downtown and, Chicago. Downtown Chicago. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, and my office probably rents six, seven spaces um, in a parking garage next door. Mm -hmm. And we have parking from, mm -hmm. I believe, like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And it's, it's uh, frequent that the people that are parking there um, are staying there until 6 or 7. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you... Like if you're going to be getting, if you're looking at getting Fortune 100 companies, you're looking at getting people, CEOs that are potentially uh, going to be working past 5 p.m. Sure. Um, how are you going to be policing that? I mean, if they're going to rent, if they're going to rent your office space, I presume they're going to want to have parking, and they're going to want to, when they pay for it, they're not going to want to make sure they're out by five because that mm -hmm. doesn't work for. Um, for them, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering how. Well, you're talking about some employees might oh, stay later than five o'clock. 
there's, there's really two issues, right? So we have the employees that may be um, the, the tenants that you are going to rent to. Mm -hmm. Those employees aren't going to get parking from their employer, right? But they may n nevertheless, um, there's, there's going to be 500 employees, right? 500 people mm -hmm. working in your building. Mm -hmm. um, and some employees, a good majority of them, will not be, uh, not have parking from from their employer that they've purchased inside the building. Right. They will nevertheless show up and park as a member of the public in the building. Okay, that's just, that's going to happen. I, I don't know what at what rate they're going to do that, but it's going to happen. Um, and so the number of available spaces to the public is not going to be the number that you quoted. It's going to be less than that. Unless there's some sort of mechanism that you have to have a chit that you you get, you know, verified, or I should say, what's it called? Not verified. At the library, that you actually have used that space, and now you go into the library and you get your card validated, for instance. Yeah, but the, uh, my understanding is that the, uh, the agreement that you have with the city is that uh, 74 spaces be made available to the public, um, not to the library. Not to library users, which I mean, I, I presume a good number of them that use that lot use the library, mm -hmm. but um, but it's for the public, and so uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, system, a validation system, it, that doesn't necessarily fit into what was what was agreed to, right? To provide seventy four spaces for for public use. Well, if you're talking about the day, during the during the day, we already did that study where where there are these all these open spaces. There is not that demand that you're suggesting, where they would have an overflow. It's I think you're talking more about this this nether world between closing time for the office building and you know people wanting to use it for downtown. I'm I'm talking about both. Yeah. Um, but you know, going back to the you know this this time between let's say five and seven p.m. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I don't understand how you're going to. I don't either at, at this point. I mean, I guess we'd have to work with our parking consultant to figure out if there's some way that I don't understand because um, that's not my expertise. But okay. I, I understand what you're saying, though. I, I get that. Yeah. And then what what uh, what kind of cars? can fit into these compact spaces if they're not like if they're not uh, legal um, city of Evanston zoning spaces you know what what can actually fit in there with a car with a door opening on at least on right. one side I know just I know parking's built tight these days right yeah. so I understand no one's gonna be able to build a space where all four doors open up like that's understandable but these seem to be narrower and shorter than than what's what's normally allowed, and so what kind of cars actually fit there? Well, actually, the city of Chicago, that, that exact space you just described, okay. is considered a full-size space in the city of Chicago for the zoning. What, what are the actual It's uh, like, I think uh, it's eight instead of, of eight, six, maybe? Yeah. Hmm? It's 18, yeah. Uh, so it's 18 long. I think it's eight by 18, is that correct? Eight by 18 in Chicago is considered not a compact space, and we only have... 20 of them. Now, we can get rid of those compact spaces in that, you know, because there's only so much room between columns, right? Mm -hmm. You know that. Um, so we get one less car per level. So we lose four cars. I I don't want to lose four cars, but if that's such a big... I mean, my feeling about this country and, and the idea of people using huge gas guzzling oversized cars and not just using like their Fiat's and their smart cars and like my little rabbit I have, that seems to me, I know a lot of people have smaller cars like that and those spots are perfectly fine for that there. And we're not saying 100%, we did, you know, we actually had a lot more compact spaces in our last proposal. We had way too many, in my opinion. Now we only have 20%. Okay, but, but it, they're eight feet wide. They're eight feet wide. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Is that your question? Yeah, sorry. Um, and then, as far as tenants, you you don't have um, uh, tenants committed for the project yet. I have to defer to Greg. I'm sorry. We did, but um, since the entitlement process took two and a half years, we lost um, fifty percent of the building, but. Um, Right now, what I'm hearing from the brokers that we're, we will have shortly um, 
I don't want to call it an anchor, but at least a quarter of the building secured, and then I think we'll we'll be fifty percent full before we close on the property. Is is that your uh, is that going to be your financing requirement? Fifty percent uh, least. No, we ha we have the the money to close on the lot tomorrow. Um, I, mean, I meant for construction. For construction. Uh, I'd rather not say in public, but. Mm -hmm. Is that all? Good. Is that all? Mm -hmm. All right. Any further questions from commissioners? All right. At, at this time, I'm going to acknowledge that we have uh, received a request for continuance uh, for which is the right of any property owner within a thousand feet, and it's been verified that that property owner is within a thousand feet. So. Uh, uh, what we will do from here is uh, uh, we normally would uh, uh, ask that uh, people who would like to ask questions of the petitioner can can do that can do that now or they can wait until the time uh, that we reconvene at a date certain. Uh, uh, so I'm going to. Uh, open the floor up to anyone who would like to speak uh, in the order uh, that they signed up and if you would like to ask if you would if you would like to ask questions uh, I will allow you to ask questions at this meeting and at the continued meeting but there at the time if you would like to also make a statement uh, you can only make a statement either at this meeting or the next meeting. I'm allowing statements now because there might be people who do not want to come back to the continued meeting, and I'd like you, like your voice to be heard. So, uh, so right now, I would uh, uh, ask if uh, Vicky Burke would like to speak or would like to ask a question. Okay, all right. Uh, Marcia Kerr? I was going to speak, but I think I'd like to delay it. Okay, and yes, okay. Uh, uh, Kim Stanton. Now, now you can ask questions now. Let me clarify. Is, is, is that clear? You can ask questions of the, of the petitioner at this, at this point and ask them again or ask other questions later. All right. Uh, so Kim Stanton, so I just have a question of clarification. So can you come to the microphone, state your name, and uh, okay. Um, Kim Stanton. Ooh, sorry, I don't really need a mic because I'm so loud. Um, incoming president um, of the Women's Club of Evanston. So my question is, if I make a statement tonight, then I can't make a statement at the next meeting, the continuance? Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct, yes. Okay. I think I'll wait till the next one. Okay. That's fine. Now, now, I am not very, can you take a guess at that? Chow, Chow Wu? I'll wait till next Okay, very good. Uh, Austin uh, Shearer. So, so the next meeting, uh, regularly scheduled meeting, is January 9th. And so, so uh, one thing I should clarify also is that the public uh, notification process has been, uh, has, is, has already been done for this meeting. So there will be no further required communic notice that the meeting, other than continuance to the 9th. All right. So we'll take a motion after the questions whether we continue or to that, okay? Uh, so Jack Weiss. Um, I see. Okay, very good. Uh, ben Shapiro. I have a statement which I'll say, but I do have several questions. Why don't you come and ask your questions? <laughs> Name and oh, address, please. Yes. Ben Shapiro, 1127 Dewey. I'm currently president of the Evanston Public Library Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not speaking for the board tonight. My questions are um, this. What was the frequency and time of day that the study was done 
to determine the usage of the library's parking lot because my experience as on the board for seven or eight years and as a user of the library for however long I've been, lived in this town, 30 or 40 years, is that there are uses of that space that are driven by events in the library. So it could be full at all sorts of times um, throughout the day and the week. So we could be busy if there is an English as a second language class, um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. During tax time, when we are helping with tax preparation, it can be busy then too. So I would like to know how the sampling was done, the number of samples taken, and what times of day they were done. Also, with the uh, vacation of the alley, uh, I understand that there was testing and some agreement from the fire department that there is access. This is, of course, a concern for us because we do get a regular visit, visit from the ambulance in the library for various reasons, not because of our overdue fines, uh, <laughs> which I would love us to do away with, but I know that's never going to happen. Um, but um, we do receive a number of deliveries on a weekly basis in 50-foot semi-trailers and in uh, large box trucks. So while a fire engine may fit um, a tall box truck or a tall semi-trailer that it needs to maneuver around that corner, may not be able to operate in that space, which would mean that we would be taking deliveries through our front door, which is our public access, and it's certainly inappropriate and not very feasible for us. So those are my two questions, semi-trailers, box trucks in the alley, and the sampling times, because I do not think they caught a representative sample of the use of our library parking space. Okay. Thank All right. You. Very good. So uh, why don't we just address these as they come, since I don't think we've got an ex exhaustive list. So. So to answer his, uh, again, Steve Corcoran with Erickson, to answer his first question, uh, we did a parking count. Let me get the exact date again. On Wednesday, March 14th, we did all day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at that lot, as well as the Chicago Avenue parking garage across the street. Um, and then my client has also done some additional parking counts. I couldn't tell you those days or dates. Um, in terms of the uh, deliveries to the library, we did look at that for uh, semi-trailers. Uh, am I going the right way, guys? Uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're All right. Um, no, we're actually going the wrong way. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you didn't do that. Okay. Sorry, he put the old appendix in there. I didn't realize that. So these are turning templates for access to the library delivery. And, and your, yeah, we, and we, yours. We did three sets. Uh, one was for the library using their design vehicle that he mentioned, the 50-foot trailers. We did one for our delivery loading dock, and then we also did the fire truck. So, so I'm going to go through all four, all of them, real quick, just so everyone knows what we did. So this is um, entry to our loading dock. A truck comes in off a of Clark, comes down the alley, goes through the S curve, so to speak, and then backs up into our loading dock right there. So we can get a semi-trailer into that dock. Now, the reality is of an office building this size, there's going to be very rarely semi-deliveries, but we did do it. It's going to be typically box trucks from day to day. Here is then the uh, exit for, again, the building's delivery truck. It comes out of the dock, goes straight down the alley, and then turns onto the street system. 
Here is the library. Uh, again, we use a slightly bigger semi per uh, information we're given on the size of the semi. A truck comes in off the street system, just like it does now. This part's all existing. Goes through the S-curve, comes to the alley, and then backs up into the loading docks. The loading docks are right in this corner right here. And then conversely, when it's done, it leaves the dock, it goes straight north, and turns on to the street. And then this one's a little harder to see, but essentially, oops, this is uh, the design vehicle that the fire department gave us their information for, and we ran a truck through the S-curve actually in both directions. This just shows one of them. And then uh, they also followed up, and they actually pulled one of their trucks out into that alley uh, with my client. They coned off the building dimensions and then ran it through and, again, felt there was plenty of room for a fire truck to get through here, and obviously an ambulance is smaller, shorter, and it can make it through. Thank you. So, so just just to clarify, uh, Mr. Shapiro, uh, deliveries are uh, currently are all only off of Church Street for. I mean, it seems similar that it's the similar situation unless they're using the parking lot for turning so yes I would want to have a longer discussion having seen this chart with our facilities manager to make sure that uh, this is compliant with what our reality is I did have a third question if I may ask that thank you I appreciate the forbearance um, snow removal is an issue for us as well since we are responsible for clearing the sidewalks all around the library and our north side east west driveway for our parking lot. Um, normally that snow has been stored in um, the, the lot that will be now occupied by this building. Uh, I would strongly recommend that there be some coordination with the developer, uh, with Northwestern that owns the dormitory to the immediate north and with us about snow removal because there's no longer any storage space. Okay, well, that doesn't seem like a question, but Sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. I would love to all talk right. with them if they want to talk with us. All right, very good. Uh, is, you, yeah. if, since you're, I know we passed you by, but you seem to have oh, a question. I just had a question. Um, uh, Hava Wu, C-H-A-V-A, -A, last name W-U, 1105 Grant Street. Just looking at the different diagrams, um, it looks like the alley will remain two-way traffic, and I guess that's my concern. Uh, or my question, you know, with the trucks coming in both directions, you know, is it going to continue to be traffic going in both directions? So that's, I guess, the question I have. Yes. Okay. So, so could you just answer it so so we get it on uh, get it on the tape? Yes, we we envision right now that the traffic would remain unchanged as two way path. All right. Very good. Okay. So. Uh, Andrea Ventek, is it? Excuse me if, there we go. Hi, it's Andrea Ventre, okay. 807 Davis, and uh, I would like to state that I'm against it, and I think there are too many uh, rezoning, requested rezoning. Okay, Thank all you. right, very good. Uh, Glenn Medahea. Am I, am I, I'm just awful. Huh? <laughs> that close? <laughs> I'm Glenn, Glenn Medea, 1401 Davis Street. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Women's History and Leadership. Uh, we run the Francis Willard House Museum and the Francis Willard Memorial Archives. I'm also the site manager for the WCTU Historic District, which is the property, the four, four, four properties immediately north of the um, of the proposed uh, library parking lot building. I'll defer on my um, comments, but I have a question about the tree protection plan. Um, there's one column that's headed protected tree question mark, and these are all trees that are on our property on the, on the borderline on the north. Um, one, one column is headed protected tree question mark and some are listed as yes, some are no, and others are blank. However, in the notes column, all say protect and only one says demolish and none are listed as replace. 
Can you explain what that means? What is this? Your tree protection plan. Your tree protection plan in the packet. Is this it here? Or here? No, these are my notes, Paul. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. I know we're supposed to have an arborist come out. Oh, sorry. Nope. I'm blocking. Um, we're supposed to have an arborist come out and do a study of those trees. I know that. Um, and so what is your question then? I think I stated it. Um, one column says protected tree, and some are listed as yes, some are no, and others are blank. In the notes, it says protect, demolish, or replace. I think so be it's, there's a lot of inconsistency, and it's hard to understand. Yeah, we, uh, Dennis Phobos with Halliburton Root, we're yes. uh, Paul's associate architect. Uh, we understood that trees are an issue, and lost trees and their protection are an issue with the site, given our five-foot setback. So we, have an, we had an arborist come out, look at the trees, look at their condition, try to tell us which ones we would lose and which ones we would keep. He made a preliminary analysis, and I think that's the report you're, you're referring to. It's, I think it's in our, in our uh, proposal. Uh, unfortunately, we are, if this project goes forward, we are going to lose some trees. We just can't, because of our proximity to the property line, it's just not feasible that we're going to save all of them. We're going to do all we can to mark the ones that he said protect that are worth keeping. Some of them he, he didn't feel were, were more toward the end of their life and wouldn't be lost. We would look to replace those trees uh, uh, that are lost, but we have to do further studies. All we did at this point was do an analysis of what's there and what's likely to be protected. But I can't tell you today that we'd save all the trees. It just doesn't seem feasible. No, I, I understand the trees will not be saved. I do understand that. My point is a number of these are said, stated as either protect or demolish, and none are replaced. So this is my confusion. Yeah, so that's and, really my question. No, yeah. Yeah. And I understand your confusion. The, the purpose of the Arborist Report was to just uh, try to tell us the status of the trees that were there so we could develop a further plan for replacement. So the report that's in there doesn't really address replacement of the trees. Okay. So that I understand your confusion. Thank you, Mr. Volos. Uh, can I can I ask a question of staff? Not expecting you to uh, to uh, respond now, but can can you clarify what is the uh, a tree that has roots that obviously extend over a property line? Whose roots are those? I mean, I mean ser seriously. I mean, I mean, is it your right to uh, you? <laughs> I, I've actually run into this situation, okay. and um, just a very, uh, very brief um, research on the topic is that um, it all depends on where the tree comes out of the uh, out of the little ground, and if it's uh, if any portion of it is on uh, more than one property then the tree is co-owned and you can't affect it in a way that um, that would, no. okay. you can trim it, but you can't affect it in a way that would destroy it without uh, joint approval. That's my very limited understanding of it, but obviously the uh, law department can, can confirm that. All right, so if we could, if we could find out whether a tree sitting wholly on an adjacent property can have its roots destroyed in such a way as to destroy the tree, you know, do they need to seek request or what, whatever the, you know, whose ownership is it in, once they pass? So, okay. All right, uh, only a couple of more names on the list uh, for uh, either questions that you can return again and ask, uh, make your statements or make a statement and give up your right to make a statement later. So Sharon Shostock? Sarah. Sarah. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm Sarah Shostak, 1602 Ashland in Evanston, and I have a couple questions. Um, one, I don't think that I have seen the copy of the fire department letter. Um, that hasn't been available in the packet that I've seen. Is, can that be provided? Um, my second question, um, there have been uh, statements about conversations with neighbors, but I've noticed that the McManus Center is not really shown on many of the drawings and their loading dock and parking ramps are not shown. Has Northwestern been consulted, involved in the process of meeting with property owners? Who? Who? Alderman, would you like to answer? Are you raising your hand? <laughs> I, I have an answer. But, um, is, we, I, I think you have to do it like everyone else does. <laughs> Judy Fisk, Chris Ward, Alderman. Uh, we've reached out to all of the uh, adjoining property owners. I spoke with uh, Dave Davis from Northwestern. Uh, as you may know, there's a change in the community uh, relations uh, person at Northwestern. It was Ellen Anderson, and now it's Dave Davis. So as soon as Mr. Davis came on board, I reached out to him, reminded him that this was an issue that was coming before the plan commission. And uh, apparently he has reached out to his uh, superiors at Northwestern. So I, my understanding is that everyone is aware of this. Okay. You might want to check. Okay. But I'd be happy to do it too. Okay. Very good. And then, do you want to, um, I have the email from from the um, the fire department. If you want me to find that, would that be helpful? All, all right. So so you're saying it is within the it's in this the packet. post the posted packet, and that is posted online or not? No. This is a this is a, actually was added the last couple of days, and we brought that tonight. So it's not in the packet. But if you'd like to see it now. Okay. It's pretty it's simple. Just, we can add it for it's the It's pretty simple. It's just an email. I, I think okay. So we'll add it for the for the next meeting. Uh, okay, fine. All right. And uh Br Okay. Bruce Grenbach. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. So so at this point uh I would like to ask for a motion to continue the meeting to uh, regarding, let me see, what, what is the PLN, who is asking the question? I, I, do we know the reason for the request for the continuance? Don't we need to state that? Do, I mean, doesn't the petitioner need to know that if there are questions? All right. I, I will read the uh, I will read the request. It is from Marcia Kerr, uh, as an owner of a property at 1738 Chicago Avenue in Evanston. I respectfully request a 30-day continuance for tonight's discussion regarding the proposed plan development case 18 PLND 0053 at 1714 1720 Chicago Avenue. We have 44 condominium owners at Lakeview Terrace. Uh, and would like to take a survey of the residents there regarding several concerns about this project, alley concerns, traffic issues, etc. We will need to call a meeting with our uh, residents and Judy Fisk beforehand. So that's the stated reason. All right. All right. Is there a motion to continue to a date certain, which would, excuse me? Oh, no, it's not. But. Uh, why not? <laughs> let's no. Let's let's do it. Uh, you know, we'd like everyone to be heard. So if you can step up, it's. Did you sign up, by the way? No, I thought it was for statements, and you said questions. Uh, yeah, it's for anyone who wishes to speak. So, so I, I wish to speak, but I'm not making a statement. I just have two. Questions. Okay, okay, that's fine, and we'll uh, we'll add you to the list. All right. I'd like you to come up after you ask the questions and fill out your name and address okay. here. Okay. Uh, so, I'm Ann Branning from 2712 Prairie, mm -hmm. and my one question, and this is probably my fault that I'm not as informed as I should be about the parking, but I'm still kind of concerned about that. Number one, I do park in that lower level library lot a lot, and I think, but I could be wrong, that it closes at 9 o'clock or something like that. 
So I don't. I guess I don't understand how that's going to be helpful if you have to be out of there by nine o'clock to the public. That's number one. How will that work? And then the second question is: Are spaces promised to the tenants a certain number of spaces based on the square footage? And are they coming out of this public space? Or when you mentioned that, I wondered: Is that separate from the public spaces? Okay. You know, like some presidents get two or the marketing, you know, whatever. I, I understand completely, uh, yes. Because we ran into that issue at 800 Elgin. Mm -hmm. The parking disappeared. Uh, third question is, are these public spaces after five, during the day, whatever, are they going to be metered spaces, ticketed spaces, or how are they going to, or limited meter, like two hour meters, three hours, or could you go in there and park for a longer period of time? It makes a difference on how helpful that really is to people, whether they'd be staying there a long time. So those would be my three questions. It might be too detailed, but it does affect the use of them, in my opinion, to the so-called public use. Okay, very good. Thank you. And, and I made you promise to do this, so. <laughs> All right, so can anyone respond to the... Yeah. So I believe number three was um, how, how are we going to... We were mandated by staff that the... Um, the, the charge and, and how the... the they were going to come up with with how the public spots 21 would be during the day and then as it would open up at night on weekends same they would determine how much it would be whatever it is a dollar every two hours i don't know what it is right now but we can't divert from that so when we said we would replace 76 they sometimes you know um they would Tell me, as the developer, are, are we going to get a ticket and then pay at the pay station? Or you, it, it's it's now changing a little bit, but th that's dictated to me by staff. So how that public parking on on weekends and after five and the 21 spots during the day is being mandated by staff to me how we're going to do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. You, you might also be able to address how how the limitations would be on the public promise spaces to lease spaces. And I believe uh, Commissioner Isaac was addressing how that issue issue was, that, that, that there, there's a certain amount of spaces that you're mandated to make public and that those, in theory, doesn't seem like they could be leased, uh, I think is the implication, you know, getting to them being fully occupied without having public access. So has there been any thought to? I don't think we've gotten that, I'm sorry. I don't think we've gotten that far with, with I mean, we're, at this point, we're just trying to find out if this building is going to be an acceptable solution at this site. So, but that's all stuff, of course, we'll have to deal with. Um, but the other question about um, you know, the parking at, at night, where I think that what was the question about whether the, the library the library closes the at nine, at nine, but this garage would be twenty four hours, so so you would have yeah. you'd have basically be able to park there. Any library patron could park there as long as they want, basically after hours. I think that's the, right. that's the concept. I think yeah. So that makes the, sense. The library parking is for the library itself and is dedicated it's not public parking can i ask staff is it is it public parking that's open but it'd be but definitely closes everything at nine okay okay mr shapiro can you uh, and the director will jump up and correct me if i am wrong <laughs> i hope thank you uh the library lot pretty much corresponds to library operating hours so mm -hmm. it, is, it closes at nine monday through thursday Six o'clock on Friday, and since I ride my bike on the weekends, I have no idea what our weekend hours are. Um, so in that case, is if you're coming downtown for dinner, the library lot is not an option. Okay. 
to. What happens if somebody parks and then it doesn't? They get their car the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yes, yes. Okay, so, that, so that's a fact. It is. Okay. If you don't get your car out, you come and get your car tomorrow. Okay. And if I may ask a question. Okay, one one more, and that's it. And then we're gonna. And and I'm Lucia Guridi, 1226 Lake. I live in Wilmette, but I'm a member of the Women's Club. I'm speaking for myself today. Uh, I do come to the Women's Club on a regular basis and uh, park at the outside parking lot, not the underground, uh, which is something important to note. They were talking about the underground, not the one outside. Um, if we're gonna lose that, what kind of security? I'm a woman of the women's club. There's a lot of women coming out of the women's club at night. What kind of, if we're gonna be parking in your parking now that is indoors with all sorts of things happening indoors that are not seen outside, what kind of security are you proposing for that parking? That's to be determined. I, I don't, I, we haven't thought about that. Can, can you please just yeah, state it about there? That. Um, that's to be determined. I think something we haven't really even thought about yet. Actually, you know what? We did have a discussion at one time about the fact that there would probably have to be somebody in the garage all the time because even, let's say a, a machine breaks down or the, the gate doesn't come down, there's going to have to be a human being there, and it would make sense that that person is a security or or a verified security person or trained to be a security person. So, yeah, I think it, I don't think it would be safe not to have some security person in that garage. I totally agree. So if, if that answers. Okay, so, okay, and have you signed up also? No. Oh, okay, can you come and then please sign, sign give us your uh, name and address also for the record. No, she didn't, and I'll ask you to sign, too. Yeah. Hi, my name is Janet Steidel, and I live at 1401 Davis Street. I have two questions. Um, can additional details be added to the plans on pages 52, 54, and 200 through 204 of the plan development application, and the same ones in the uh, plan commission packet on pages 41 and 43 to help further depict existing conditions along the alley, including two underground parking ra ramps and a 40 inch high back platform, including exterior sta stairways along the alley at the back of the McManus building, a 48 inch high back stoop off the WCTU administration building, the underground parking ramp for Lakeview Terrace condominium building, and the surface parking and loading areas at the Women's Club of Evanston, the WCTU campus, and the back of the apartment buildings along Clark Street, that's my first question. And um, my second question is, can the alley center lines shown in the perspectives on pages 39 through 41 of the plan development application, which are pages 28 through 30 of the plan commission packet, also be shown on the plans in on the pages 52 and 54 of the plan development application? And those are on page 41 and 43 of the Plan Commission packet. That's all I got. Can they be added to the drawings? I'll sign. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. That's, those are very long questions, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure there are physical center lines on the alley, but uh, not. In the drawings, in the perspective drawings. That, and they're, yeah, I, they're great, and they, they, they should be made So I, I think maybe they're proposing it, but I don't think uh, I don't think it is part of the existing. Oh, are we just talking about the traffic stripes and stuff, or? I th think traffic stripes in question two, yeah. <laughs> well, sure. Great. Um, in the perspective drawings that were provided to show conditions of the alley, 
um, there are there are there's a yellow center line uh, indicated, and this is for the proposed building. Are you going the right way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, yes. <laughs> Could go either way. Mm-hmm. Can I go get a cup of coffee? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so these, the yellow center line is shown on these perspective drawings, but there, and that's with the new building in place. Can they also be shown on the traffic uh, plans, and can they also be shown on those lines? Those. Now, do you want to know where I want them? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. There's a little pointer thing, too. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, so you see those lines? Yeah? And um, they have conditions in the alley. Uh-oh, I think I'm not going Uh-oh. <laughs> I am going wrong. too many things. It's because I don't have lines in the alley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. So, it's all right. Um, oh, oh, oh. Boom. So I think it's this one. There are no those those yellow lines are not indicated in the alley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And then um I would like them to be drawn particularly on this one. Because I think it will help people understand more the pathway through the alley. Sure, sure. All right. So the purpose is the pathway. Pathway. So maybe the turning template for those trucks could be enlarged. Is the sure, or we could, or we could add to this drawing and also show car radiuses in here if that would be helpful too. Yeah. Okay. And sure. and then the very long first question with all the with all the loading docks and and uh, things. What what is what is that for? Well. I'll tell you that what I think is important is that um, the two uh, ramps to underground parking at the McManus, McManus Center, which are on this alley, they are not shown in the drawings. There is also a, black, a back platform on the back of that building, which is... Um, this one over here on the right. Yeah, but they're not on your plans, on the plans. Oh, I thought you meant you wanted pictures of them. No, no, I got oh. pictures. Oh, okay. I'd like them to be shown on the plans so that we can really see all the things that empty into that alley. Got it? Okay. Yeah. So the, the underground parking ramp should be shown. Uh, the, bla- the back platform on the back of the building should be shown. There's a stoop on the back of the WCTU administration building that sits right at the alley line. I think that those would give a better impression of how tight that alley is. Plus, there are surface parking lots and delivery areas at the Women's Club site and also at the WCTU um, um, historic site, there are two parking, surface parking lots that I think should be shown because they have traffic coming in and out of there as well. And there are parking, surface parking lots at the okay. buildings behind, on blah, 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 on Church Street. All right. It should be shown. All right. Just, just be clear, um, when we're what we're proposing is vac- vacating that one triangular piece of the alley yes. and and sending our building back east five feet, which makes the alley behind our building wider than any other part of the alley in the entire thing. So that's feeling the safest. That's probably the safest area. We don't have any control over the university building and their concrete things and stuff. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, what what we what what we can do about that? Yeah, I, out of I, our control. I do, I, I do understand, and I think I think that things that are outside the effect of the project maybe are not, you know, are not their responsibility to address if they're outside. We don't mind putting it on the drawing if that would help. I don't know. I don't understand why, but I I sure would we help. Have this? Yeah. Is this? Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, very good. Yeah. Thank why you. not? Okay. We don't have blueprints from that project, so we'd have to basically go out and measure, you know, just uh, do the best we can hand measuring on the site. You know, so. Thank you. All right. Any more? Okay. Very good. Is So we need a motion to continue, uh, continue case number 18 PLND 0053 to a date certain of January 9th, 2019. I so move. 
Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, do we need a, a voice vote or, or, or do we need a roll call? Is it a roll call? The voice, okay. So we're going to do a voice vote. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? All right. So that will conclude this case and it will be continued to the next regularly scheduled planned commission meeting on January 9th. Thank you, everyone. Yep, I think that's fair. So we are going to take a two minute break for anyone who wants to stay for all the exciting things that are gonna happen afterward. Can I, can I ask one question about the continuance? How many continuances are allowed? Just the one, so it can't be continued okay. beyond next Okay, one, one by neighbors, yep. Okay. Okay.
about disability and stuff like that. She's the wife of Glenn Block with Dana or from Father Francis Wilkins. She wants to disclose that she has, she has a personal and financial interest. She really does. Somebody needs to know that. And I'm not going to tell her. All right. I think we will reconvene if we can. So as the uh, yeah, the mouse has been passed. So Uh, Ms. Jones. So the next item on the agenda is a text amendment, case number 18 PLND 0102 uh, for a uh, ORD uh, redevelopment overlay district. Uh, Ms. Jones, would you like to present the issue? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. The uh, text amendment that is, or the first text amendment that is in front of the commission today is for our ORD, or Redevelopment Overlay District. Um, this district was essentially created to allow for some flexibility in land use layout and design in redevelopment areas where there is an opportunity for mixed use development or development projects in which uh, one or more of the uses are different from, but compatible with the principal permitted uses in the district. Um, and a planned development is required for all new developments within the ORD districts. Uh, currently, our overlay district, or this particular overlay district, is applied uh, in the southwest portion of the city, north and south of Oakton Street between Hartree Avenue and the city limits, so essentially um, where the Sports Dome and Home Depot is. Um, so the permitted uses within the ORD overlay um, are outlined in Section 615.13.7, Permitted Uses, and they are uh, any use listed as permitted or special use in the underlying base zoning district, and that is highlighted because that is an important point that we'll get to in a second. Uh, dwelling or multifamily dwellings, uh, when not more than 30% of a particular planned development site, um, excluding affordable housing as determined by the Plan Commission, but in no case shall that actual total housing area, include, including affordable housing, uh, be more than 60% of the site. Uh, mixed use development and retail goods or service establishments when located on the ground floor. Uh, staff is actually proposing uh, two uh, different uh, amendments to these particular sections. Um, the first one is a pretty quick one to Section 6.15.13.2, or Procedures for District Designation, uh, we would be proposing um, in Subsection A to add the C1 Commercial District to the list of zoning districts where the redevelopment overlay uh, is permitted to be uh, designated. Uh, currently, there actually is already an area in that southwest portion of the city that is zoned C1, just for whatever reason is not in this particular list. Uh, the second portion of the amendment is to actually amend sections uh, 6, 15, 13, 7, permitted uses, and actually create a new section, 6, 15, 13, 8, special uses. Uh, specifically, uh, for 6, 15, 13, 7, which is permitted uses, we would uh, cross out the small portion of uh, subsection A where we have or special use for the underlying base zoning district and create a new subsection where uh, we list special uses for the ORD district uh, shall be any use listed as a special use in the underlying base zoning district. So basically what this particular amendment would do would make it so permitted uses that are within the underlying zoning district are also permitted uses in the ORD and then special uses that are listed within the underlying zoning district are also special uses within the ORD. The way it's currently worded, uh, it's worded in such a way where 
one could interpret it to be that both permitted and special uses would be outright permitted within the ORD overlay district. So um, with that being said, we have our standards for amendments. Uh, that is whether the proposed amendment is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive general plan as adopted and amended from time to time by the city council. Whether the proposed amendment is compatible with the overall character of existing development in the immediate vicinity of the subject property. Whether the proposed amendment will have an adverse effect on the value of adjacent properties and the adequacy of public facilities and services. Uh, so that being said, we'll open it up. Okay, so so uh, so I'm just going to note that uh, we're not going to be taking questions from the public because there is no public. The last person has left the room, so we're go we'll do it. <laughs> we'll go just from <laughs> commissioners. Who's who? Who would like to ask any any questions? Get any clarifications on the issue? Everyone is absolutely clear on what this is. Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, pretty straightforward. So. All right. So, uh, so of course we have uh, we have our th three standard choices. We can either uh, make a motion to approve as presented, or approve with with modifications, or to recommend to to recommend denial. All right. So, is there a motion? I move to approve. The zoning text amendment as presented by staff. Motion Goddard. Is there a second? Second Halleck. All right. I think we need a we need a roll call vote on this, right? Sure. Sure. All right. <laughs> Commissioner Draper? Commissioner Dubin? Yes. Commissioner Goddard? Aye. Commissioner Halleck? Commissioner Isaac? Aye. Commissioner Pagotzi? Aye. And Chair Lewis? Yes. That motion passes. All right, very good. So the third item is a text amendment uh, number 18 PLND 0103 uh, for public benefits for planned developments. Again, Ms. Jones. Yes. Uh, so this particular text amendment is actually uh, revisiting a, a discussion that occurred at last month's commission meeting uh, where we began the discussion on public benefits and what type of language the commission might want to see uh, for any updates that we uh, propose. Um, going back a little bit, uh, these are the current public benefits that are listed within the code. Um, they are pretty broad in general. Um, and uh, off of the discussion that occurred last month, uh, we got the direction to uh, kind of narrow in and make the public benefits a little bit more specific, um, especially with regards to how we have been uh, approving and reviewing public benefits thus far. Um, and for our most recent approved public benefits, we've had them fall into several different categories, um, including street scrape, uh, streetscape and infrastructure improvements, CTA and metro transit provisions, uh, car share provisions, public art, vehicle charging stations, uh, and green building, uh, which would be above the minimum LEED silver certification, which is required. Um, and some of the other public benefits have been uh, public park rec creation, uh, vegetable gardens, a waiving of move-in fees for residents that are employed by the top ten employers in Evanston, establishing an entrepreneurship or apprenticeship program for ETHS students, and a hiring of Evanston residents. So staff went back and has proposed the following amendment to our code. It's a pretty substantial change. Um, we are proposing to amend Section 6363 public benefits so that there are three subsections which would describe goals, list possible public benefits, and then uh, provide standards for reviewing those public benefits. Uh, specifically, for the introductory paragraph um, that would now read, the public benefits to the surrounding neighborhood and the city as a whole 
are intended to be derived from the approval of plan developments and are measured based on the quantity and scale of requested site development allowances. Public benefits are not considered to be the proposed principal uses on the zoning lot, but rather an accessory feature or use complementary to the proposed principal uses. These benefits should not be limited solely to the proposed development's residents or tenants, but should also be accessible to the public and or mitigate impact of the development on surrounding residents, infrastructure, and utilities. So the first section is probably going to look very familiar. Uh, we took what are currently our public benefit standards and made them into goals. Uh, because they are so broad, they uh, address a, a broader range of things that we are seeking to have. Um, the only changes that are uh, proposed is to uh, remove uh, item four, which is use of design landscape or architectural features to create a pleasing environment or other special development features. Uh, this is essentially a part of the process that happens during the course of review, uh, especially through um, our DAPR committee, our design and project review committee reviews. So this is something that we kind of feel is a standard anyway. Mm -hmm. And also uh, number seven, business, commercial, and manufacturing development to enhance the local economy and strengthen the tax base. Uh, we decided to remove that because that's something that's essentially a given with the new development. Um, if you're going from a vacant lot to a structure that's going to change the tax base and um, we're looking for something that's a type of more substantial of a public benefit. Um, and lastly, we adjusted item nine slightly, uh, just taking out, uh, this one addressed the uh, sustainability aspect of development. Uh, we're just going to remove the section that says such as level silver or higher lead or leadership in energy and environmental design certifications. We're essentially removing that because we're going to address it more specifically um, in the next session. So the completely new section that we're here proposing um, actually lists out public benefit categories and lists some examples of how um, those particular aspects could be addressed. I uh, won't go into complete details for all of these, um, but the categories are affordable housing, encouragement of alternative modes of transportation, streetscape improvements, infrastructure improvements, public art, sustainability measures, education and employment, preservation, and open space uh, and park dedication. Uh, the second new section uh, would be standards for evaluation of these public benefits. So um, this is actually a section that is similar to um, a section within the redevelopment overlay district. Uh, we essentially took that language and changed it um, so that it addressed uh, development and public benefits. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually go through these. Uh, the first standard is the size or capacity of the development or public benefit or provision, the degree to which the location of the development or public benefit within the structure or on the site of which it is a part enhances the environment of the zoning district of which it is a part, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of the streetscape frontage where it is to be located and the zoning lot itself, the degree of public accessibility to the development or public benefit given its location and the specific nature and function of the public benefit feature, the quality of design of the development or public benefit in the context of the principal use of the zoning lot, the location of said zoning lot in the zoning district, adjacent properties and uses, the use and street frontage character of the zoning lot, said zoning lot within, and the policies, designs, and plans of the city, the degree to which the development or public benefit enhances and protects the environment of the zoning district, including such elements as air quality, noise reduction, wind effect, temperature moderation, uh, views, pedestrian environment, landscaping and areas for relaxation, and the environment of the city's historic resources. The degree to which the development or public benefit lessens automobile traffic congestion and supports car sharing, public transit, pedestrian and bicycle usage, the degree to which the development or public benefit increases the availability of quality environment employment, 
excuse me, opportunities to the residents of the city, the degree to which the development or public benefit enhances the economy of the city, the degree to which the development or public benefit provides for or incorporates social services for the residents of the city, and uh, finally, the degree to which the development or public benefit provides for and protects the public health, welfare, and safety of residents and employees and the visitors to the city. And there's a small paragraph at the end which states that uh, the city council may find that the degree to which any of the above standards are met are not sufficient to mitigate or offset the requested site development allowance and or impacts of the proposed development on the surrounding community and may request that additional public benefits be provided. So that's essentially what's proposed at this point. And again, we have the four standards for improvements of amendments. So with that, um, I will open it up to any questions or comments. Okay, thank you for the very clear and concise uh, explanation. So, uh, Commissioner Halleck. Yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't here at the last meeting when this was discussed, but um, I, I, first of all, in this last list, I would eliminate four and five. Four and five seems to be um, what you should expect from a, a, a development like this, and I think they're, because yeah, it addresses design, and the, the, the uh, in the previous list, when you took out a couple of those items, it seems like they address the same thing, like this is, this is to be expected. Um, the other thing is that, and I think this is uh, generally, um, I think this generally about these public benefits is that, uh, especially like this last development that came in, I, I thought those those public benefits were extremely weak, and I know this doesn't this doesn't designate um, any sort of. Um, it doesn't qualify them as you know if you're responding to one of these items it doesn't say whether your your response is strong or weak it could be a lot of different levels of response but it seems like what what we get into is that there's no there's no um qualitative guideline or quantitative guideline better yet quantitative guideline in other words it's not tied to okay this will this this will you, you need to put in so much money to to do these things there's no there's it's just so vague and so loose and i i just i i i, I think the best thing chicago did was to eliminate a, lo a lot of those um benefits that they had listed in their zoning code and now it's basically you know you want more far you have to pay for it very simple and there's a there's a there's a calculation and it's and the developers know what they've got to do to achieve a certain thing and i think that helps developers and it certainly makes it easier on us so, so that so the general comment is is can we make it more quantitative yeah so so i think that was part of the initial discussion was sorry and i'm sorry i missed last yeah, time so. was uh, there were there were presented <laughs> you know different ways of looking at this totally you know one is the prescriptive old chicago code you did a setback you got so much bonus for a setback you got so much bonus for a plaza you got so much what whatever it was that's very you know very prescriptive thing that's a total change from where we are so so the so I guess the question, the basic question is, is are we going to recommend a total overhaul of the public benefits section or are we going to move it incrementally from what is there to another, to, to a little more specificity? I guess the question is, is this, is this way working? Is it, is it working or I, I just, I, I was just, I was so, um, annoyed I guess by the list of public benefits that that these guys uh, came up with because I thought they were nothing absolutely nothing even though they addressed they addressed a lot of these issues but they really weren't anything yeah. <laughs> and, and just just gonna uh, just costing commissioners not just it probably best to speak in generalities, not on unspecific projects um, that aren't noticed under this item. But um, but I certainly understand that point, and that was that was part of uh, some of the discussion we had before. So there is some language in this um, that that at least gives an idea of sort of the degree of the the site development allowances versus the degree of the benefits. 
but um, and that's in, in some of that language in C there, the, the second sentence, for example, um, Planning Commission City Council shall consider the degree to which the following standards are met by the proposed public benefits within the overall context of principal uses um, that are offered. But I, I, I the, the point is taken, I think uh, uh, Chair Lewis um, uh, summed it up well as kind of um, you know, whether we want to move to either incentive-based system, you know, um, kind of a tit for tat, you know, uh, percentage basis of uh, X improvement gets Y FAR, um, or or the the neighborhood opportunity uh, fund system was was brought up as well that Chicago has moved on to in certain areas of the city um, that that Commissioner Halleck referenced um, to essentially buy additional FAR in certain areas of the city where that's been been allowed. So one of the one of the benefits of the looseness is is that it allows innovation, where the prescriptive is is set. It, it, the the guidelines are are there, and you don't get any kind of innovations from it. You know, you just play within the rules. So in a way, I would say yes, it works in that that it has come up with all these various ways of. Of benefiting the community for, and 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 modifies itself as it goes along. So when parking boxes come up, instead of parking meters, that can become a public benefit. You know, how do you pay for that, right? So so the the way things ch change, this this allows change to happen. You know, and and stay current and relevant. Where I think you, in some other ways, might create a dinosaur right away. You know that it's it's so fixed. You know, I've I've been on the other side of this of this desk, <laughs> and I know what happens, and I know how developers think. It's like they 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 want to satisfy the goal in the least financially impactful way. And I've done and that in the prescriptive way. I, I sat there and did calculations where I manipulated the how the setbacks were and the whatever in order to maximize the FAR and the uh, you know the the height and all sorts of things. So yes, I mean that that is the goal is to mac their their goal is to make money and maximize, and ours is to is to create public benefit for the. For the community of Evanston. So. Okay. Well, may, well, maybe I guess we just disagree on this, but I think that from the from the developers want to know. They they want they want to know. They they don't want they don't like variables and uncertainty. They want to know. So I think a more prescriptive uh, method would help them, and I think it would just it would eliminate a lot of the arguments. But does it? But does it? Is it in the best interest of Evanston? I mean, I mean. Well, I think do, the, uh, do neighbor to, the, the, neighbor, the neighborhood opportunity get, bonus opportunity bonus in Chicago has been hugely successful, hugely. And what it does is it it puts a financial amount on benefits, and and then and then the city gets to decide how that money is spent, mm -hmm. not the developer. So I don't know that it limits creativity. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is true, but the motivation of that was because of the the higher the impact only being realized on the downtown area and pressure in order to get money spread out into the community, which is. But and, uh, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but something more more prescriptive, I I guess. So. Uh, so that's taking this to a very big issue, I, whether we should stay stay uh, within the means. Uh, basically what's being proposed is a refinement of the current system. In order to clarify it, give a little bit more definition. Uh, and uh, you know what's what's now being discussed is going to going to evaluating the entire the entire system, uh, whether there's a better way to deliver that. And so wondering how to move forward in that. Do you have a comment? Um, yeah, I think um, I think you know based on the discussion we had last uh, last meeting, um, I was uh, I was very happy with what has been uh, has been drafted. I think it uh, it focuses what um, the community is looking for as far as pub public benefits, um, which I agree are kind of vague, but um, it's 
it's more focused and it's not too specific where um, we're uh, we're boxing ourselves in and we'll have to revisit the issue um, next year. Um, and so, um, you know, I think uh, I think what's been drafted is good, and uh, you know, I'm prepared to support it. Any other comments, or can I call it Commissioner Draper? Yeah. Um, I've got a question about the lead category. So is it currently the status in Evanston that we're pursuing lead buildings? Because there's now starting to be a bit of a pushback between is lead the best method? And do we want to like have any other options available for the future proofing of this? So so, so that's even more generalizing, all right? But yeah. but based but yeah. still still you're modifying this existing format, right? Not the big, big right. issue. So just that point. I'll okay. Sure. And, and to maybe add, add a little uh, additional information there. Um, uh, lead silver is what's required now in our green building ordinance for buildings of a certain size, and, and generally all the planned developments are there. So that's where it is currently. Um, I think in the city, some some staff. I don't think we've really. You know, brought it to a policy level, have thought about using other systems or equivalent systems, green globes or, or other yeah. passive house, other things that are out there. Um, so we certainly uh, you know, have collected some information about those, and at some point would probably be looking to update that green building ordinance. So that would probably be the place where we really get to it specifically there. But I think we did just want to um, clarify in the plan developments that that's not really a public benefit since it's already a requirement of the green building ordinance so, to do so, lead silver. So I think the point is, can the can the wording be modified to refer to the basic green build, the you know the the Evanston Green Building Ordinance, as opposed to whatever that entails, mm -hmm. as opposed to naming lead silver or above. So so the measures, yeah, would change. Yeah, it's a good point. We could maybe take a look at that. Um, and we take a look at the slide previous to this, and and just see if that language could be broadened a little bit um, um, to. Yeah, to, to maybe uh, something in, in excess of what's required by the, the City of Evanston's Green Building Ordinance. And as those standards get higher, then obviously becoming in excess would, would be a higher standard as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, there is a little bit of mentioning the LEED 55 because there's a lot of local local interest in the bird bird safety. So stating i don't know if it is appropriate to state it here but it is it is you know in the regulation uh, uh i would you know maybe think that that should be put in somehow into the into the uh into the green green building code you know and and then we could still you know keep it simple even though this does make it a pertinent topical issue for now it doesn't have uh, maybe the longevity of so uh so i'm 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 understanding that there may be yeah some acceptance of the system how about andy why don't you well, I, commissioner I, pagosi excuse thank you. me um, I, disrespectful. I do agree with george i mean i think it 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 would help um streamline the process a little more and, and one one thing i've heard from um people who go through our evanston process uh, do tell me that it, it is very cumbersome and it is you know it's it's a lot of process and um, any I think anything we could do to make it to simplify it to quantify it for you know very clearly um, I, we already do that to some degree with the housing ordinance I mean you if you can't satisfy or if the economic model doesn't work to hit the right mix then they they put money into the fund to offset that i mean isn't is that optional? yeah i know it's not optional but if if we were to okay if we if the person if the developer can't meet the far and they want to buy more area then we put a quantity um you know on that far so they you know people can understand um, ahead of time before going through all of these committees you know what what it what it's going to take to arrive at a solution that will be acceptable 
without without kind of get well if I add some you know if I add a some div, a divvy station here and and maybe you know change a couple of street lights maybe they'll make it go away maybe they'll accept my my setback encroachment you know so it it it, it I, I think the goal should be, and I'm not suggesting that we just, you know, I think what's been done is good because it 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 puts into words what those improvements are, which which is helpful. But um, I think getting you know getting more um, uh, a, a direct uh, you know costs associated with what what it takes to get something built because that's ultimately where they're getting at. They're looking at their calculators and it, it's all about money in terms of whether or not a project goes ahead or not. So it, 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 um, uh, I think the easier we can make that without compromising the values of the good citizens, I think that, I think that, that it's a good goal to do that. Um, so I, I think all of these things could are items that could be used with the money that is charged to buy those those uh, rights. Um, so are you suggesting that developers, if they can't provide these, they just give us some money instead? That's, yeah. I, and I, I think we literally put a cost on, if you, if you want to buy an extra story, the, then we you know, it's going to cost you. No. It's going to cost you more money. So, let, me, oh. let, me, let me just like, kind of push that uh, a little forward. So if someone's willing to pay the money, then we have to agree, right? We wouldn't have a basis for saying no. Yeah. W within a right? certain parameter, yeah. Within yeah. a certain parameter, yeah. So, I mean, for, for money, we are um, effectively... Uh, Seeding at least some amount of control, yeah. and you know, I, I presume that a well, an analysis of what our current FAR um, standards or what the limits are right now would have to be part of the uh, like investigation to determine what where the limits should be and how much we should allow people to buy. Right? I, I don't. I don't think it has to be automatic. I think if they're going, if they're if they're asking for FAR, for example, above zoning, I think it's still a decision to be made. But I think it, I think adding some quantitative um, information to to these is is just helpful for them to know what level we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. you know you can you can meet these standards with you know fifty bucks. You know what I mean? Or you can meet them with $5,000. And I think what we need to say is that, you know, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to meet, if you're going to go for this qualitative standard, it has to be in the, in the financial commitment level of X. And, but, but it still makes the whole project. It, it doesn't say that we have to approve it just because you do that. But that's a, that's a standard for approval. But, mm -hmm. but you so would relinquish we're, that aspect of it. I mean, the if they give if they are willing to pay the amount for FAR, then then that big a building goes there. You know, if if the building, you know, and we wouldn't have the right to say this is a strip of land where all the buildings are are little single family sized buildings and now we're putting up a big tower in the middle of it i'm you using know, chicago as an example with this neighborhood opportunity bonus it is not a guaranteed approval it just tells them that if they do get this this is what they're going to have to uh, have to pay but it's not an automatic approval hmm. another way of thinking about it instead of paying with divvy stations and car sharing Instead of paying with divvy stations and car sharing stations, you're putting up cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's still, yeah, you're still subject to scrutiny because you're you're asking for uh, a variance to the code. Okay, so they so, have to. so let's let's ask if we ask staff like if we were to add a concept like that to this and give someone an option, say you can either try to meet it one way or meet it with 
with m money. Um, I presume staff would have to look at that and determine what the money was and and talk to talk to other staff about um, where that money goes and how it would be spent. Um, I definitely don't think it's something that we would, we yeah, would look I, at today. Yeah, I think and I, I don't many. know that it. I don't know that it affects. At least the way I'm I'm thinking about it in my head is I don't think it affects the language we're looking at today. But maybe it's something that we can look to add to, and say you have two choices, right? Developer, you want to try and meet the goals this way, or you can meet the goals with cash. And I presume that um, that some of the commissioners believe that um, a large number of the developers would uh, choose to satisfy that with cash because that's just, it's more certain to them, right? Yeah, so so I, I, I think that changing the system, it, it has a lot of complexity to it and would have to be, you know, would would be a long process to do it. I mean, totally doing it. Not only is there the complexity of weighting what's the value of each thing, you know, are we charging the right amount for the right object, but then once we get the money, the whole mechanism within the city has to be set up to spend and distribute that money, and that becomes a political issue, and, you know, I, I don't... That's not our problem. I, I don't know, you know, it gets beyond really where we're, where we're at, I would imagine. So... Uh, you know, call me old fashioned, but I, I don't I just do not like this idea of pay to play. You know, I just I, I would rather see a, an additional park or something or five more trees than them paying me see, paying the city a thousand dollars. And you know, that's where I fall in this. It, it it sounds like pay to play, but this system that we have is still pay to play. And and I'm telling you that these developers are looking for the cheapest way but out. But this is voluntary. Yeah. What you're ta what you're proposing is mandatory. No, no, yeah. I'm not. I'm you give me, it. you give us a hundred thousand, you get two extra stories. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm. I actually am not saying that exactly. I'm just saying that I, I'd like some quantitative, um, so, something quantitative to be added to these because because when you look at any of these goals someone could look at it and say hey i'm i'm uh i'm complying with this and it's only going to cost me a hundred bucks but i'm complying with it well that's assuming that that the three bodies who who review this the staff who has a lot of discretion under this system to negotiate is is not doing their job us who are not are not doing our job in order to enforce the the benefits the proportionality of the benefits and the city council all don't all don't I, I mean the example of paying a hundred you know getting getting past light is not probably correct I mean it may be heavy you know we may be heavy-handed in it but I doubt we're ever going to be light in in the in the restrictions so uh, um. <laughs> Okay, I I just think that that's how developers think. They think in cash. Uh, I and I and yeah. I don't think when we look at these things, we th we're thinking in cash. When when if we were to get to the uh, public benefits of the last applicant, I think some of them sound great, but there's no cash assigned to it. So well, well I mean that's you know. part of that's part of the discussion and the deliberation should be should be you know whether whether there's value to the community given for the for what what we're giving them you know in their development so that's part of the discussion in any in any i'm going to be general in any discussion so okay i, I guess uh, I, I and it's fine what you're saying i, I just was looking for some guidelines better guidelines for us as well as them. yeah 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 so, so i I, I I think it. I'm not trying to change the system. I'm just trying to add some. But what if it's more than just you know another floor is a hundred thousand dollars? But we're talking a bit more specific, like one half of one percent of your budget is public art. Like getting into those sort of yes, yes, things. that's a perfect example. Like you know, right now public art is a good example where you could just commission a you know you could commission 
local artist and spend five hundred dollars because you're saying you're commissioning a local artist. You have to spend so much on public art. That, right. That's a perfect example. So I mean, like some of these ones could be more specific. I definitely see that a lot of these could be very vague. Like the other one is about. Um, Let's see, the public transport and, you know, stations, so it's, do we want to give a specific, like? Well, well, so, so yeah. what happens, what happens when there's a, there's a pub, piece of public art on every 50 feet on the street and we've got enough public art, you know? I mean, what, what, you, what do we do? I mean, you, things, you, reject, you know, the needs are going to change idea. and the benefit of, of a system with flexibility is that it allows you to change your priorities as a community. Once you prescribe it and codify it, then then it's there for until we have the next revision to the codification, you know, which is a, a large process at every every step. So it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate the subjectivity of the overall evaluation. But I understand that yeah. the difficulty, it's so subjective, but when a developer first comes in, don't they sit down with staff and kind of get an idea of, of what might give them extra, a bonus, an extra story, I, I mean, so that it doesn't come to the point where we have to say one crossroad is, one crosswalk isn't good enough? Don't, I mean, I, I understand from what you're saying and my husband, the architect, goes through this all the time with the smaller communities. But again, it, it, don't they usually or often just sit down in, at the very beginning and get some general idea of what quantity they need to provide? Uh, st staff can answer that. Yeah, generally speaking, there are number of discussions that occur before a project gets even to design a project review committee. Um, and it can be subjective. It's kind of on, it's definitely on a case by case basis based on the type of proposed development, where that particular development is, what may be happening around that particular development. And that can kind of dictate uh, what public benefits we seek. So, in some place that's more heavily built up, we might not be requesting as much with regards to like Divi stations or something like that. Um, we may want to do something that's more beautification and something more along those lines. Um, so th there's definitely a good amount of discussion. Um, and, and to a couple of the points that I'm hearing there is a negotiation that occurs with regards to pricing even. Because I'm thinking with regards to some of the plan developments where we have re uh, required or put a condition on approval where they donate or they provide like $75,000 towards a traffic signal improvements or something like that. So there are cases where we do put an actual number for a particular public benefit. It just depends on what public benefit we're looking at. We don't necessarily do that for um, a specific piece of public art, although we have quantified that before and requested a 5000 or $10,000 um, payment be done for that. So I mean, there are cases where we do negotiate some kind of price for the public benefits. It's not something that is extremely prescriptive where, okay, you have a four-story building that is next to a school or something like that. We need to have this particular amount of money for XYZ public benefits. There is a lot of negotiation that takes place. So um, I think if we were to do something that is that prescriptive, I don't know. It, it may be something where we maybe refer to it within the code and maybe do something where um, 
there's an administrative aspect of it because I'm, I'm thinking that is something that would change on a pretty regular basis, um, especially from what we're hearing from developers with um, increase in construction costs and things like that, that the pricing amount would change. So they might not be able to necessarily have the same amount of money for the next 20 years or the same percentage of their budget for the next 20 years. So it, and it did, I'm definitely hearing what different sides are going on. I'm just thinking of different options that might work. So I, I, I mean, I, I understand your, um, your point. Like we can get to the same, we can get to the same place we are otherwise getting and there won't have to be many discussions, right? It'll cut down lead time. We'll get the same benefit and it'll just make it a lot easier. Right. I mean, I like all that sounds amazing. You know, like if if it can be administered, right? If we if we can actually get from where we are now to there, and still have the um, and make it not prescriptive on us, right? On us, right? Like so, if we can have our cake and eat it too, it sounds great, right? Like and it, it, um. Well, I, I don't know if it's subjective. I mean, if you if what we have in the zoning ordinance is certain things that are for sale, we have FAR increases in FAR, setbacks. Uh, you know, uh, in residential there are other criteria. There's square footage per unit, and other measures like that. And that's what's what we can increase discretionarily in a plan development. So let's just for any better cost, call it for word. And so we could have that system where we sell those for amount of money and then just give it to some body of the city to 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 sell for whatever whatever they're gonna spend it on. Art, you know, divvy stations, whatever. Or we can do little menus that are that that still don't do that, that you know don't sell those things but sell put prices on the on the benefits and i don't think it's really possible to say what a divvy station is worth or what a art piece of art is worth or you know well it, but there's a, there's a there's a cost associated with it right not what it's worth but how much would it cost to put in <laughs> i mean that that is determined art or because bad ultimately art. someone does pay for it yeah. and it gets in there yeah I, I understand right. the frustration on that, but, yeah. it, but I think for now, for what we're working with, and a community this size, that this is a very comprehensive guideline, and I, I think you did a great job on pulling this all together. So, uh, I, is there? So, I, I'm going to probably ask for a motion from some someone if there's no more discussion. On the on the proposal at hand, and can I go there? back to my the first okay. thing that came out of my mouth when I, yeah. um, which was that on that last list, there's I said number four and five. Um, yeah. Okay, so so that would be part of a, a motion w could include modifications to this proposal of eliminating four and five and changing the. The things that have been proposed are eliminating four and five on the standards for evaluation and on the, under public benefit categories B, rewording the sustainability measures to refer to the city uh, green ordinance. So those are possible modifications to this proposal. Is is that what you're talking about? Or I, I guess I'd like. To, it, it, if there anybody else had any comments, agreed or disagreed on, I thought four and five are are items that that should be in any development. They're yeah. not. They're not benefits. They're just requirements. So, is there any any comment on? Well, that? I, d yeah. I don't know if I disagree with that, but I, I mean, I think someone who f the wind, where's the wind tunnel one? I mean, if someone puts something in that's mitigating the potential for a you know, uh, what do they call those wind tunnels? I, I think that's something that could be considered an environment. Yeah. I mean, so, a be public benefit. Yeah. So I guess I guess my comment would be would be yes, we consider it as design professionals to be basic design things, but I don't know where else it's codified within the within the ordinance that that those are values that are 
that are held. Uh, is there other places that four and five would be codified? So in, in, the, in the lead criteria, there is another place where it's codified, is the green you know, building ordinance. And we can refer to that. I don't know where four and five would be referred to. So if it's referred to somewhere else, I would happily you know, shorten the thing. It's, it's it's not that I'm against it. It's just that I don't think it's a public benefit. I think it's a requirement. I, yeah. yeah. And you can't you can't yeah. come in here and say, hey, I'm designing a nice building, and therefore I'm give me give me uh, you know extras extra FAR. Oh, right, right. Seems so ridiculous. That's, that's a good point. So, so how do we make it a requirement? It, <laughs> um, <laughs> what about the standards for approval of a plan development? Are are, are are four and five um, otherwise included there in obviously much different language, but something to that effect? Because if I, I agree, this is this is something we, we look at. Well, we're not the design right. and review yes. right. committee, right? But um, but that's definitely a, a way we look at things, and it would seem to me that it would it would need to be in the in some way in the uh, in the standards for approval of a plan development, if it's just across the board, that's where that's where it, it should would be yes. found. Yes, I agree. I agree. And I, admittedly, have not committed that to yeah, memory. Yeah. So, so in in six eleven one ten plan developments, it does mention that each development shall be compatible with and implement the adopted comprehensive general plan as amended from time to time. Blah blah blah. Uh, uh, use. Uh, use or urban design specific to the area. Uh, this zoning ordinance and other pertinent city planning and development policy, particularly in terms of land use, land intensity, housing, preservation, environmental, whatever that means, and urban design, traffic and parking, impact on schools and, and public service facilities, the essential character of the downtown neighborhood planning. Etc. So I I don't know if environmental, you know, encompasses that, or I think wind wind would be included in environmental. Wind, yes. yes. Wind, yes. Um, isn't there one that's uh, like it's just it's just a sort of a catch-all that has doesn't have an adverse effect on the um, on the surrounding properties? Right? Isn't the, isn't there a catch-all there? Oh yeah, there. I mean, yes, it, yes. It, yes. it, it, it would seem, it would standards, seem to me that yeah. that that five in the standards for evaluation of public benefits or the proposed standards for evaluation of uh, public benefits would ultimately fall into that category, right? And it's very vague, and we can decide what it means depending on what the what the project is and where it is and what it's doing to mm -hmm. the surrounding properties. So. So uh, can I ask staff, either one of you, what is your motivation in including these as opposed to, you know, especially calling these out as, as, as a... So, so, so actually, let, 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 me, let me step back because maybe we're misinterpreting this. This is not a suggested public benefit, but this is a criteria for evaluating public benefits. So it is, it is actually not... Uh, something that you can ask for. It's just dawned on me that uh, it's just saying that you can't you can't be a you can't create bad environment as part of the public benefits. Maybe the confusion is the use of the word uh, development in four, five, and well, it looks like four. Starting at number four, oh, it's actually in all of them. Because if we're only talking about the public benefit, maybe we should remove the word development instead of saying, you know, the quality of design of the development or public benefit. Just say the quality of uh, the quality or of design of public benefit. That doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I mean, that, yeah, it needs to be design. Well, but right now it says the quality of design of the development or public benefit. So the way I read it. Is one way to and public benefit. You should know. Should. Yeah, and, the way yeah. that it was worded here is so that you can 
look at the development itself to see how it contributes or does not contribute, but then also look at the public benefit and kind of juxtapose oh. the two. So, so you're you still looking at the development itself to see how it impacts the surrounding area, but you're also looking at the public benefit to see how it may mitigate that impact. So, so that was the motivation behind having both in there, but if that needs to be changed or modified to be clearer, then you can do that. Yeah, I have to say, I, I missed your point yeah. that these are guidelines to evaluate. They're yeah. not public They're benefits. Not public and benefit. and yeah. so that, Well, I didn't realize it either. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, public benefit enhances and protects them. How about, I mean, like just with respect to four, the... Um, the, the positive effect of a public benefit on the quality of design of the development in the context of the principal use of the zoning lot? I know, but I mean, that's, you know, it's not, I mean, it goes on. <laughs> yeah. So, so I have a, not just a little digression from this, uh, these standards for evaluation, are you envisioning staff that this would become something that would be read off and evaluated as we do the standards for special uses, et cetera, in, in, our, in our deliberations? Would we go through each one and say, does the development, the quality of the design of the de development benefit the context of the principal use of the zoning lot? You know, and, and state those things and go through that process? or. I think the idea is it would be used in the, the evaluation of the, the project and the public benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so it would likely be referenced in the staff report, uh, like we reference the standards now for, for map amendments, special use, plan development, et cetera. Um, and then kind of depending on the project, um, how specifically uh, it's discussed by the, the commission. Um, but it should be uh, criteria and evaluation for the, the project by the commission. Not just the public benefits, but the project itself. Yes, and which, I admit, which, is, which, is, which I totally agree with. Right, and we That's already right. do have some existing standards for the project itself. Obviously, in, in the, the map amendment, special use plan development standards. This could apply also. Okay, so uh, I. I don't think anyone is feeling that strongly about about either eliminating or modifying the wording. I think the elimination doesn't help the cause, does it? But modifying I, I, the I actually, can I make a motion yes. to approve this as written? I, I know I sound crazy after all these discussions, but well, and you can do that. I'm going with. I'll second that motion. I'm going with the flow here. So, but can, can I just can I just ask? No one wants to modify the wording of of item six under public benefit categories. Okay. Well, I haven't acknowledged any of those. <laughs> this is okay, regarding the green building been, ordinance. A motion has been, uh, yeah, made and seconded by who? Who made the motion? Me. Sure, Halleck. Uh, Commissioner Hollick and seconded by Goddard. Okay. <clears throat> so, is to adopt the motion as written. Is there any discussion? Thank you very much. Yes. It's getting late. All right. So I think that means that uh, we should have a vote as written. Uh, so why don't we do a roll call vote? Okay. Commissioner Draper? Yes. Commissioner Dubin? Aye. Commissioner Goddard? Aye. Commissioner Halleck? Yes. Commissioner Isaac? Aye. Commissioner Pagotzi? Chair Lewis. Yes. All right. We did not go through again the standards for amendments, but I believe we met all of them uh, in this motion. So I put it right out in front, and 
That's so hot and heavy. But uh, all right, so let's move on to other business. Uh, do you want to guide us through through the schedule, the proposed schedule? Uh, sure. I don't have a slide or anything for this. Um, generally, these are just the standard meeting dates for the year for the plan commission. Um, we reserve the second Wednesday of each month. Um, if necessary, we reserve the fourth Wednesday of each month, and just in case there are a lot of different projects coming through, which, for warning, there is in the coming few months. Um, and then we have the, the zoning committee, which is probably one of the committees that meets the most, which uh, we set aside the third Wednesday of the month for those meetings, and those are scheduled as needed. All right. Is there any, any comment by the commissioners on the uh, schedule 2018? Uh, 2018. It's, 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 but it says 2018 oh. meeting, so we should, that's one of my comments, is to change <laughs> it to 19. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Isaac had raised an issue sometime about uh, October 9th being Yom Kippur. That's my understanding. Yes, is and uh, well, <laughs> well, we'll you'll you'll all have to take well, us out for a beer afterward. Thank you. I'll bring cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll so, we'll sing happy birthday to you with you not here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, So do I have a motion? I move to approve the schedule with the understanding that we may move the Wednesday, October 9th meeting to uh, uh, accommodate uh, Yom Kippur. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Commissioner Pagosi. Can we do a voice vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? No, and the motion passes. So October 9th is in question. So now there's all the fun about the ooh, election of officers. So there are two officers' positions to, to fill. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So the chair and vice chair. Uh, are you I don't have going to something it. important? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so I think we need to uh, uh, nominate a chair. Are there any nominations? I nominate Colby for um, chairman and Mr. Isaacs for vice chairman. Is there a second? Second, second Alec. All right. So why don't we dispense with this with a dual position vote. Let's do a vo voice vote on this. So, well, we, we can we can do a voice vote, can we? Or or not? Can we? Yes, yeah, yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah. Let's do a, let's do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. All against? All abstaining? Aye. Oh, I've never abstained, so I vote for yourself. Yeah, I know. Only when it's a secret ballot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, so so I there are several. So you said economic development committee does not have a which one does not have a the position HCDA okay. is uh, yeah, okay. no housing community and development. So so uh, Commissioner Goddard, you are off that committee. Yeah, I have a conflict. I can't meet with them anymore. Which is yeah. too bad because I love the committee. Okay, all right, that was active. Active and you. Well, yeah. I thought it was active, but then. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So we have uh, we have several committees to uh, to to fill. So the zoning committee is currently currently uh, manned 
manned, if we excuse the term, by Commissioner Dubin, Commissioner Goddard, and Commissioner Isaac. Is there, are you all willing to continue to serve on those? Is there anyone who would like to join that committee? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, I think we'd probably like five on there. I think there were five on there, and I think two of the commissioners who were on there are, are no longer with us on the commission. So, so, so the chair of the of the zoning committee is, has historically been the vice chair of the plan commission. So, if I volunteer for that, I won't be mucking up the works, right? So, no, never, good. Good. Yeah. You'd, Ford was on it? Okay. Well, I would volunteer to add myself to to the zoning committee. Anyone else? Okay. That one's got something coming up, by the way. Uh, do we need to, uh, so is it the committee who votes on their chair, or do we vote for the chair of that and when do we do it? I think the committee can vote on the chair. Would, would the first order of business on the zoning committee be, you know, election of a chair or can we do it now? <laughs> hey, if someone wants to volunteer now, we can probably take care of it right now. Or if you want to go with past historical precedent for that. Yes, I think we should go to I'm, past I'm happy to chair the committee as long as you're going to be okay not being the chair I, of the committee I, I, I to am the commission. Exactly, I am just okay. so happy. Okay. The, the date has to be changed at the top of this table also. Oh, yep. I told you, she is great at editing, editing stuff, right? This proposal writer and detailed. I love a red pencil. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's the uh, Comprehensive plan, plan Committee, which has not met for a while. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, Commissioner Dubin is, is the chair. I was on that. Commissioner Pagosi was on it. Commissioner Brown is no longer on it, and Commissioner Halleck is on it. Are we willing to stick with that? Sure. I think Commissioner Dubin has to especially sure since she's the chair. Yeah, okay. Sure. All right. That's fine. Uh, rules Committee. Uh, currently, there's Lewis, Isaac, and Commissioner Goddard is the chair. Anyone wishing to join that? So, so if I can explain and correct me if I'm wrong, that's really, really uh, talking about the code that, that defines, defines all the processes and committees and things that... Bylaws. Bylaws, basically. Of. Anyone want to join that? Other than that? Okay. So we'll stand as, as, as is. Uh, so the liaisons, there are there are now three liaisons uh, with housing, community, and development uh, no longer being relevant. So the Economic Development Committee, Andrew, you were the li liaison. Yeah. You good with that? Um, sure, unless someone else wants to do it. Anyone, anyone eager? <laughs> All right, we're good. It feels like they need every day. Okay. All right, uh, the Planning and Development Committee, I am uh, willing to be the, be the liaison, although I haven't done a very good job at it, I, I think. I don't even have the mic on. Uh, unless someone else would like to, like to be it, but it, traditionally I believe it's the chair of the Plan Commission. Uh, transportation and Parking, Commissioner Dubin. I'm fine with it. You're you're good. So I think we can call that as as it stands. Okay. All right. I uh, 
There's no motions or anything with this. I, th I think you'd probably do one motion to approve the, okay. the slate as described. Okay. So is there a motion to approve the overall slate of, yeah? So moved. Second. Okay. Beautiful. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? All right. The motion passes to... Uh, approve the 2019 appointments per the modifications discussed. Uh, there is no public, so we'll dispense with that. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Pagosi, Dubin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? All right, so it's unanimous.